Okay, so let's start implementing the moving average filter. First of all, the current thing we, that we only have is the is the user provided storage array, uh, which is a pointer to the array and uh, uh, filter size, the filter size. So here we obviously need something more. We would, for instance, want to have the current uh, average and the sum of all the numbers for for the specified filter size um, that we currently have. So sum which are, both are long reals but we also need to have an index to the to where we currently want to store data in the storage array so some index integer we can start with this um, and this is the nice thing with with this pointer to long real i mean with pointers in twinkia 3 we can actually check it uh, pointer to 3 it's this one you can use index uh, access to variables of type pointer. Which means that if we create an array like we did here in the tests of long real, we can access this array through this pointer just as a normal array. Um, okay, we have the average, uh, which we, the, if imp, the method get average we can actually implement immediately. It's quite simple. It just returns this value. So get average is average. Okay. The tricky one is the add data point. So first we need to calculate the position of the storage array where we should put the number x. And uh, this is done by calculating the index, which can be calculated by index, the co whatever the index is now, plus one. But we wanted to wrap around the filter size. So we wanted to go all the way up to filter size and then do uh, start from the beginning. So if the filter size is three, we, we don't want it to go higher than, than two. Um, so modulo uh, filter size. Yeah, so yeah, the filter size is, is not an integer. This is probably what it complains about. Yeah, so just a constant int to int. <coughs> um, like that. I think that should do the trick, yeah. And the next thing we need to do is to... Actually, yeah, let's just do a quick calculation. If we do, if we start at zero, this is zero, uh, it will be one. Okay, so it will be one, which is bad. We want the first number to start at zero. So we can just initialize this by minus one. Yeah, that will be fine. Then the first one will be zero, second, yeah. We'll see. I mean, our tests should show if this is, if this is not working. Next thing we need to do is to calculate the sum, and the sum, we need to remove whatever value is currently stored in that position. Uh, oh, sorry. Like this. Because we only want the sum to be the moving average sum. I mean, the, the sum of the last, yeah, if the filter size is 3, the, the filter size of the of the last three ones. So we need to remove the one that is in, in where we're gonna currently gonna add the number. And then we can store the, sorry, index. Here we're storing the number that the user has provided in the, in the data storage. And now the sum is the sum plus x. <clears throat> uh, let me think. Yeah, I think that's that's it. And and finally, we need to of course to calculate the average, which is the sum divided by um, the filter size. Let's see if this compiles. Sh 
I usually do like this, check on objects. Okay, all fine. So what we can do now is to is to run our tests and see whether this is enough. I have a feeling it's not enough because here we are assuming, actually here we are assuming that the filth, that the sum that it, sh it should always be divided by the filter size, which is not the case because we have specified some tests where we've where we only added one or two numbers out of, of a filter size that is bigger than one or two. But anyway, the test should show that. So let's run them. Yeah, exactly. This is nice. Okay. So we actually have three successful tests, but two ones that have failed. And we can immediately see that the ones that have failed are are the ones that that don't use the full filter size. So add just one number, expect average to be that one number. Which, if you look at that test, add just this one, the code. I mean, here we only we have a filter size of uh, yeah, what is the filter size here? The filter size is five, but we're only wanting one number, one hundred thirteen. So what happens is that. Our current code takes 113 and divides by the filter size, which is 5. So let's see what we have the calculator. Uh, 113 divided by 5. So it, it, it thinks the moving average should be 22.6. Ah, yeah, which we can actually see here. It expects it to be, which is of course wrong. It should expect the moving average to be 113 because we only added one number not five or, or more. So this we need to correct. Okay, and uh, so let's correct it at data point. Uh, so we need to, we basically need to know if we've added enough numbers up to the filter size. Um, so let's, let's just do it by creating some, some Boolean that just does indicates this. Let's just have a state variable here, uh, equal, yeah, I need to come up with a good name. Names are always hard. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's fun to program, but it's coming up with good names is, I'm really bad at it. Okay, so equal or more data points than filter size. Boom, yeah. So boom. So we need to check if, yeah, I think if we have, yeah, okay, so that's, yeah, if this is true, that is, if we have an data points that are equal or more than the, than the filter size, then we do this calculation. Otherwise, we do, uh, the average calculation is the sum divided by index plus one. Because we start at minus one index, yes, correct. Then it will be in the first case it it will be one. So sum will be divided by no sorry. Minus one zero. Yeah. I think this will do the trick. However, we, we of course also need to set this to true whenever we have gotten the amount of data points up to the filter size. So if we haven't, if this is not yet true, yeah, then we need to set it to true, but we only want to set it to true if index is equal to filter size minus one. Because index starts at zero and will go up to the filter size minus one. Makes sense, okay. Then then this will be true. Okay, what does this complain about? Uh, yeah, of course. Index is an integer, so... Something like this. 
actually no this one like this minus one yeah so as soon as we have had it enough data points up to the filter size this will be true and then we will divide by the filter size but until then we'll just dividing by the by the amount of data points that we've added which is given by this one I hope at least I mean the tests are gonna show us if we've done some wrong thinking here which is the whole reason why we want to do these tests fun stuff And here we go. Yep. Quite cool, right? I would want to add some final words to this. The funny thing here is now that the good thing is that the user doesn't only have the function block, which does all of this funny stuff. And I mean, when I look at this code now, because I just created it, all of it makes sense to me. And it will probably make sense to me tomorrow as well. But in three years from now, probably not. And um, someone else downloading this code and looking at it, and maybe there's going to be some maintenance. Maybe we want to add some more function block. After all, it's a math library, so we want, would want to have more code. Anyone downloading this and looking at this might not understand it. So what we have here is a test suite which explains with all of this code, how this function block works. Based on this inputs, we should get this output. And we got some explaining text as well for the, the, for the different tests. Based on these inputs, this is the output we should get. So this is like a living document, I would say, which is really nice because it's, it's always provided with the code and I really like it when you have test cases provided together with the code because this is always the first thing I look at when I try to understand someone else's code. If it's C++, Java, it doesn't matter. I, I think it's, for me, it's a, almost a necessity to understand what, what code is doing, at least when it's gone up to a certain level of complexity. And now let's just imagine that the user wants to add some functionality to this moving filter. I mean, in this case, the moving fil moving average filter will, uh, moving average function block might not, there might not be too much to add to it, but in many cases, the code can be much more complex. And more importantly, there might be function blocks that are dependent on this one. And you want to make sure that it still works. So you do some changes in the code. You add some more function blocks, you make dependencies to this one, you might modify it a little bit. In this case, you want to make sure you haven't broken anything. And it's very easy to test that you haven't done so by just activating the configuration, rerunning the tests, and making sure that the test still succeeds. And in this case, we're running all of this locally in our Twinket environment, just here on my local machine. What I suggest strongly is to integrate it, integrate all of this into your software development pipeline. So preferably if you have a build server, for instance, what I mostly use is Jenkins so that these tests are automatically run when you have committed this code into the version control system. In this case, the user or the users that are interested in this uh, library might get an email or some notification that the tests don't succeed anymore. You should look into why they don't. So you basically want to automate this. I mean, you should always still have the possibility to run it locally if you want to, but in a major software development process pipeline, I think try to automate it. 
So this was just a very simple example of uh, developing Twinka 3 software using test-driven development and uh, unit testing. And what I wanted to show is that it's entirely possible to do uh, test-driven development even in the world of automation and that I think that the world of automation should start to look into this more. And uh, I mean, you still need to do the integration testing. So if you have some, some external dependencies to a uh, network, uh, database, uh, files, uh, you, you still need to do the, the testing of, of the, these different uh, systems talking to each other. But, uh, I mean, even with the, the nice thing with, with doing object-oriented software design and, and doing it uh, test-driven development is that you start to think about how to design the software so that you try to minimize this. I mean, you still need to have the external dependencies, but those are separated. And the nice thing with object-oriented software design in Twinka 3 is that even if you have external dependencies, you can do something called mocking. So you just uh, you mock an object, in this case a network, for instance, or a, a connection to a database, and then you can still do the, the unit testing on the, on the software that, you, that is uh, your responsibility, basically. And I will, I will, get in, I will show more about this in, in future videos. And so what got me sold into unit testing is basically the two major points for me is, is this documentation and that it forces me to design the software in, in, in a certain way. So instead of previously, I could design software and I had two or three classes or function blocks in the IEC world uh, that did all kinds of stuff with w doing test-driven development. It automatically, it, in some way, it automatically made me des design smaller and smaller function blocks. Much more of them, of course, but every function block had just one very single responsibility. So, so which, which is kind of nice. And, and it's kind of fun because... You know, with, with PLC software, the fun thing about PLC software, the number one fun thing that I like to, why I love to work uh, developing uh, Twinkat software is that, I mean, previously, if I did C++, Java, whatever, I, I could work with enterprise systems, doing a business system, a salary system, or a web shop. Uh, I mean, the, the lifespan is really short. So the lifespan of the software could be uh, one, two, three, five years, I don't know, quite short anyway. Uh, while with PLC software, I do it for some sort of a machine that most likely will be running for 10, 20, or I mean, in the current case, possibly 50 years. So most likely in, in many years from now, in 10 or 20 years from now, there will be some poor guy or girl looking into my software uh, for some upgrade or maintenance or whatever. Uh, and uh, the, the number one thing, I mean, it, the thing that doesn't that takes time isn't to, to write the actual software that you're supposed to do. It's to understand what the software is doing right now. And this is proven and, and been shown many times over. So if I can make that person's life easier with all of this documentation, with all of these tests showing what the software, based on these inputs, uh, these are the outputs you're supposed to get. To get that person to understand what the function blocks are supposed to do. I mean, that's I think that's just fantastic. So... Uh, yeah, that, that's basically what I wanted to what I wanted to say about that. So I I, I will provide all the links uh, that uh, is necessary for for you if you want to try this out yourself uh, in the description of the video. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed this video. I would really appreciate if you could write a comment or two in the in, uh, below and give a thumbs up or okay if if you hate test driven development and think this sucks, a thumbs down. Uh, so. Until next time, see you.